This is CNN. Tonight on CNN's First Evening News, the economy is limping, the concern ringing through Washington. Who's watching your money? A lot of money showed up at a children's hospital six years ago. The donor was a mystery, but not anymore. He's accused of embezzlement. And the marathon that has gotten in the way of wine tasting. Winning is not important in this race. From CNN Center in Atlanta, this is First Evening News with Bill Hemmer. And good evening. Some say it's topic A at the White House, what to do about a limping U.S. economy. A panel of experts say there is light at the end of the financial tunnel and it should hit by the end of this year. But in the meantime, President Bush faces the question about the economy now. CNN's John King live at the White House with the plan this evening. And John, does the White House think it has done enough at this point or is there more that can be done on this front? Well, the White House line, at least for now, Bill, is that the president has done enough. The White House takes a lot of pride in getting that big Bush tax cut through the Congress. Many said it couldn't be done. The president believes it ultimately will help trigger an economic rebound. But make no mistake about it, as the president says, wait, be patient, the political pressure is mounting. The president's strategy for now is to watch and listen. What a Florida today. Mr. Bush had hoped the economy would get a jolt from his big tax cut and the Federal Reserve's interest rate cuts. But many nervous Republicans in Congress say it is time to do more. He'll have to look at these uh, other options, and uh, I think it's important that he hear from others what we recommend in the process. One idea gaining steam is a temporary cut in Social Security payroll taxes. That would put more money in workers' pockets immediately, but also mean less money in the Social Security Trust Fund down the road. It would uh, undermine one of the long-run uh, objectives of policy right now, which is to strengthen the Social Security system so that it can pay benefits to the baby boomers when they retire. Cutting capital gains taxes is another idea. It will clearly cause a growth in the economy. It always does. And as an aside, it brings in more revenue to the government. But Democrats say cutting capital gains taxes would, for the most part, benefit businesses and wealthy investors and would love the chance to argue that the president's first instinct in a tough economy was to help the rich. We want there to be a formula to get us out of this mess. Any one thing is not going to do it. It's not, you know, we can cut spending, that's not going to do it. We can lower taxes, that's not going to do it. One urgent Bush priority is keeping a promise not to tap the Social Security Trust Fund to pay the government's bills. Now, spending cuts or some accounting gimmicks will be necessary, likely to keep that from happening in the current fiscal year. That fiscal year runs out on September 30 at the end of the month, and there's already talk of putting a budget rule in place that would automatically force spending cuts next year, if necessary, to keep that Social Security money off limits. Bill? John, of all the economic data we see on a weekly basis coming out of New York and Washington included, is there a piece of that economic data the White House pays the most attention to? Anything to do with consumer spending, Bill. Remember, one rationale for the Bush tax cut was give $300 or $600 checks to the American people. They will spend it and keep the economy from tipping in a recession. Just today, the Federal Reserve, new economic statistics saying consumer debt essentially stable last month. That's bad news in the White House view. It means that Americans aren't spending their money because they're worried about the economy. A troubling sign as the president insists his tax cut will ultimately help trigger a rebound. And John, quickly here, we heard from Senator Trent Lott in your story there. Is there more pressure coming from Republicans as they look down the road, and even though it's 14 months away, the elections in 2002? It certainly is. President Bush doesn't get to go before the voters until 2004. History tells us the president's party suffers in the midterm election, so Republicans are quite nervous. They do not want to be seen as apathetic when it comes to the economy. They are pressuring their president to help. John King of the White House tonight. John, thanks to you. The defense secretary declared war today on the Pentagon. Donald Rumsfeld calls the bureaucracy an adversary which poses a serious threat to U.S. security. CNN's Jamie McIntyre on the frustration of changing course. So today we declare war on bureaucracy, not people, but processes. In an unusually blunt speech aimed directly at the Pentagon's bureaucrats and military brass, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld launched a frontal assault on the Pentagon. In this building, despite the era of scarce resources, taxed by mounting threats, money disappears into duplicative duties, bloated bureaucracy, not because of greed, but gridlock. He compared the Pentagon bureaucracy with its five-year plans to the old Soviet Union. With brutal consistency, it stifles free thought and crushes new ideas. 
and he said reform was no less than a matter of life and death. I have no desire to attack the Pentagon. I want to liberate it. We need to save it from itself. While heavy on rhetoric, Rumsfeld was light on specifics. He again made the case that closing unneeded military bases could save three or four billion dollars. He promised to cut Pentagon headquarters staffs by 15 percent and move officers, in his words, from the bureaucracy to the battlefield. And he said he will consolidate duplicate jobs and shift more work to private contractors. But there's a limit to how much Rumsfeld can run the Pentagon like a big business, argue his critics, who say his tough talk seems to signal frustration over the slow pace of reform. This is not new. Every secretary has, says it at one time or another in his tenure. The problem is that government isn't a business, and there are very good reasons for all of the uh, things that uh, frustrate secretaries, and a lot of them have to do with the fact that we have a political system. Rumsfeld's aides insist far from being frustrated, he is energized by battling the bulging bureaucracy. In his speech, he laid down a marker. If there is to be a struggle, he said, so be it. Jamie McIntyre, CNN, the Pentagon. And a closer look at missile defense under fire. A pair of senators debate the issue later tonight on CNN Tonight. I have that for you, 10 o'clock East Coast time, 7 o'clock on the West Coast. Another political note tonight, CNN has learned that Elizabeth Dole will run for the Senate in the state of North Carolina. Our congressional correspondent, Jonathan Carr, reporting to former Transportation Secretary and Republican presidential candidate plans to file the necessary paperwork tomorrow. This in hopes of succeeding the retiring Jesse Helms. A disturbing report today on the sexual exploitation of children. The author of a new study calls it the nation's least recognized epidemic. The three-year study on child exploitation finds that between 300 and 400,000 children in the U.S. are victims of sexual exploitation every year. Married men with children, the most common solicitors of sex from underage kids. Up to 96% of assaults on children are committed by relatives or acquaintances, according to the study. And when looking at who's behind the abuse, 122,000 are runaway, 73,000 live at home, and 52,000 are so-called thrown away or abandoned children. We apologize for the lack of graphics to cover that particular story. The report contains an 11-point action agenda to deal with the current problem. Now, a competency hearing for Andrea Yates uh, set for Wednesday. Yates is the Texas woman charged with drowning her five children back in June. Age range, six months to seven years. Yates is pleaded innocent by reason of insanity. Her family says she suffered from extreme postpartum depression. More on the Yates case later tonight, 8 o'clock Eastern on Wolf Blitzer reports. Andrea Yates, a mother on trial. Then at 8.30 tonight, the point with Greta Van Susteren continues the discussion on the legal case against her. The spread of the mosquito-borne West Nile virus across the U.S. called explosive. And it's creating a risk of disease throughout the year. That's according to a federal group tracking the virus. They briefed members of Congress that the illness could reach the West Coast in Mexico by next year. Americans spend millions of dollars every year on things that claim to make them look younger and look thinner. But today on Capitol Hill, a Senate committee scrutinized a multi-million dollar dietary supplement company and whether it made blatantly false claims about its products. GB Data Systems, owned by Almond Glenn Braswell, a California businessman pardoned by former President Clinton for mail fraud. The company's campaigns target senior citizens. Braswell refused to comment, invoking the Fifth Amendment today, but a, a former company officer did talk, describing Braswell and his ad tactics as predatory. A million-dollar gift ends up in the hands of a children's hospital, but now the FBI says the secret Santa is guilty of defrauding Ronald McDonald. CNN's Art Harris and this report in Atlanta. Even Ronald McDonald turned out to celebrate. For you too, because we are celebrating today. This is a happy day. Woohoo! For six years, it's been a million dollar mystery. Hey, help me, Fred, will you? Oh, this is heavy. Ooh. A month before Christmas in 1995, a McDonald's game piece worth $1 million shows up in the mail at a hospital that tries to find cures for dying children. You're a big kid. All right, let me just put this out of the way. Come on, gang. That's the symbolic million-dollar check McDonald's gave St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. After verifying its Monopoly game ticket was a winner, donated by some anonymous Santa. 
McDonald's generously waived the rules that only the winner can claim the winnings and has been paying the usual $50,000 annual installments to run for 20 years. It's the largest anonymous gift in St. Jude's history. No clue who or why. It came in a plain white envelope like this. The postmark, Dallas. No return address. No one ever took credit. Everyone just thought it came from deep pockets with a big heart. That this person or persons must sleep extremely well. Uh, assuming that the person who donated this is listening or watching, uh, do you have a personal message? We love you. Now, almost six years later, CNN has learned that this man, Jerome Jacobson, nicknamed Uncle Jerry, claims to be the mystery Santa. You'll recall Jacobson sure. is now accused of being the mastermind of a scam that allegedly stole millions of dollars in winning game pieces and recruited shills to cash them in. Breaking the law is not a game. Jacobson and 20 others have been indicted for allegedly rigging the chain's monopoly, who wants to be a millionaire and other promotional games. The indictment accuses the alleged ringleader of embezzling more than $20 million in winning game pieces since the scam began in the late 1980s. Prosecutors say customers had little chance of winning before the FBI, with McDonald's help, shut it down. Jacobson, arrested last month in Atlanta, worked for the company that McDonald's hired to run the chain's contests. We want you to have the opportunity to see who Mr. Jacobs is. He's 58 years old, he's married, and has a family. Prosecution and defense sources both acknowledge Jacobson is the source of the mystery ticket. Sources close to Jacobson tell CNN he was in Dallas in November 1995 when it was mailed. A shock to St. Jude's when it tumbled out days later. Jacobson has pleaded not guilty in federal court. But if later convicted, he may try to use the St. Jude's million-dollar donation to try and win a reduced prison sentence, those close to him tell CNN. Prosecutors are likely to argue larceny, not charity, inspired Jacobson to play Santa to St. Jude's. A lark after he failed to recruit a helper to cash in the winning ticket before the contest deadline. Both St. Jude's and McDonald's were surprised when CNN identified the mystery Santa as no, the accused swindler. St. Jude said if asked, it would return the money. But McDonald's said it had no intention of asking for it back. Art Harris, CNN, Atlanta. Stocks move sideways today after seesaw trading on Wall Street. The Dow closed off just a fraction of a point today. The Nasdaq gained about eight points, and the S&P 500 added almost seven points today in trading in New York. The direction of the U.S. economy, though, in the crossfire tonight. From Washington, Bill Press on the left and Tucker Carlson on the right. That minute's running, boys. Good okay, evening. Okay, we're going to... Uh, good evening, Bill. How you doing? We're going to try to straighten it out with uh, Senator Chuck Grassley and uh, Congressman John Spratt. Now, Tucker, I have one question for you about the economy. In January, you know, the, uh, the Dow was about uh, above 11,000. Now it's less than 10. Unemployment was 3.9%. Now it's 4.9%. Tell me again why I should be happy that George Bush was elected president. I don't know, Bill. Let's just really quick go through the Democrats' three-point plan to bring the economy back on track. It's whine, complain, and do nothing. This is the most pathetic election strategy I've ever seen. Sit back, gloat over the downturn, hope it brings you into office in 2002. It may work. Nothing to be proud this of. And I hope you are not. No, this is the phoniest excuse I ever heard for doing nothing. Listen, Tucker, you for know doing what you nothing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me finish. You know what you tell your kids when they make a mess? You made the mess. You clean it up. George Bush made the mess. Right. I'm He's got to clean it up. He did not, not make the, the mess, Democrats. and Democrats control half of Congress, he and did. they're standing back like they can do nothing. Big bad George W. Bush this, wrecking the world, and they're not... Oh, this that is, is September. Totally, it's that is all his mess. That's what they're running on. It's you always, waste it's always to see you two getting along so well, too. Well, thank you, Bill. It warms it. the you. heart. Thank you, guys. See you in about 16 all right, minutes. All right. Coming up here, a U.S. serviceman accused in a case of rape, but under Japanese law, who's on trial? The onus on the accuser when we come back here. And later to Bordeaux, where you can drink no wine unless you arrive on time. You're watching CNN First Evening News. Would you like to lower your monthly mortgage payments or use the equity in your home to consolidate your credit card or other debts? Just log on to Ditech.com or call 1-800-71-FIX. Today's low fixed rate with zero points is only 6.875%. 
lower interest rates, lower monthly payments. It's smart money from Ditech.com. For fast, friendly service, apply online or call 1-800-71-FIX right now. Makes you happy? Post your resume now. Monster.com. You the monster. Real news, real fast. Because your world has changed. Because your life has changed. And we understand that. A network that's accessible. We're always here when you need us. For the latest weather and travel updates, business and financial news, sports scores and highlights technology and the web culture and entertainment the new cnn headline news he says he talks to the dead skeptics say no way can he really speak to the other side an extraordinary hour with renowned psychic john edward he'll take your calls tonight 9 eastern on larry king live then it besets thousands and often without warning but can alzheimer's be predicted on cnn tonight at 10 followed by Greenfield at Large at 10.30. That's all tonight on CNN. In just a few hours' time, U.S. serviceman Timothy Woodland goes on trial in Okinawa, accused of raping a local woman back in late June. Rape is considered a serious crime in Japan, but the Japanese approach is much different than here in the U.S. CNN's Rebecca McKinnon explains. Glad to be a woman. That's why I to be a meeting to raise awareness about sexual violence. An anonymous letter is read aloud. It's written by a young woman from the city of Sendai who says she was raped by her professor. He says the sex was consensual. Could I have done something different? I don't know. I was scared and confused. Now I'm told women who don't fight back hard enough are promiscuous. Her lawyer describes how the case ended up in civil court instead of criminal court, in part because the police discouraged her from prosecuting. The young woman sits unidentified in the audience as speakers denounce a culture and legal system which they say is biased against rape victims. In Japan, there are uh, conviction rate is very high, as you know. Usually that 98%, around 98%, almost 100%. The reason for, for that is the, the before going to the court, public prosecutors carefully selected their strong case. The young woman agreed to talk to us if we agreed not to show her face. She describes suing the man in civil court. The district court agreed she was raped. But an appeals court said that while the professor did force her to have sex, it wasn't rape either. The court uh, what decided that the plaintiff uh, was uh, what the plaintiff behaved without any caution. That's one point. And the other point, the court said she did not resist this. Not completely. During the case, some people around me made it clear they thought the rape was my fault, the young woman said. Then the judge agreed with them. I was in despair. Unlike in the U.S., Japan has no rape shield law. When a woman is raped, what she wore at the time, her sexual history, and her personality are all fair game. Japanese lawyers expect the same will be true in Okinawa, where U.S. serviceman Timothy Woodland is going on trial for the alleged rape of a local woman in this parking lot at 2 a.m. after they both came out of a bar. Woodland, too, says the sex was consensual, raising the stakes for the alleged victim at trial. If uh, that case uh, is tried at the United States, maybe victim... Mm, we'll get more satisfaction about the outcomes. The young woman in Sendai says that since her court cases, she has heard from many rape victims, 
who chose to be silent for fear of public humiliation. Rebecca McKinnon, CNN, Sendai, Japan. Now from Belfast, Northern Ireland today. A six-day of protests against Catholic children walking through a Protestant area to get to school. Those protests, though less aggressive, but certainly a bit more shrill. Protestants blew scores of whistles as the kids were escorted to class. From Istanbul, Turkey, police say a suicide bomber killed himself and two police officers. At least 21 others were also hurt in that blast. The attack occurred near a police checkpoint downtown in Istanbul's European quarter. Mad cow disease arrives in Asia. Japanese officials say they have found the country's first known case of mad cow disease. Until today, the only known cases have been found in Western Europe. Since the mid-1980s, a hundred people have died after ingesting infected beef. For more on mad cow disease, including a timeline in history, the sickness, log on and go to our website at CNN.com. As always, AOL users can use the keyword CNN. Weather is next year. Also, the home run chase continues and it gets very interesting. And the race in Bordeaux uncorking a bottleneck when we come back. MDX, taking the SUV to a place it's never been before. when you retire. Conseco offers a wide variety of retirement products that can help. Conseco, step up. The nation's unbearable economy has many Americans concerned with dropping markets and rising unemployment. Who's to blame and who's got the solution? A debate of economic proportions with Press and Carlson in the crossfire. Coming up next. We were in the island, exploring the only volcano in the world you can bike from top to bottom. It was a place we found on Travelocity. We experienced what it was like to spend a day in the clouds. Great trips stay with you forever. On Travelocity, we'll show you a calendar of choices for the price you want. Because a great fare isn't great if it's not available when you are. Travelocity. Go virtually anywhere. Closed captioning for this program has been provided by Verizon Communications. Which side will you take in the crossfire? Next, then top newsmakers want to talk to one man. Wolf Blitzer reports, followed by The Point on CNN. Great vacation moments are registered every day in Florida. See for yourself. Now that you've seen part of what we have to offer, Ready to make some moments of your own? Great moments, great vacations. Florida, call now for your free Florida vacation guide. FLA USA. Water, its magic lies in its ability to alter shape and form. Not surprisingly, water is the ultimate symbol for change. How appropriate. Greater Fort Lauderdale home to so much water is also home to so much change immerse yourself this is cnn 
Later tonight, are you at risk for Alzheimer's? A new test may be able to give you a heads up. Find out how on CNN Tonight, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 on the West Coast here. A rather productive weekend for Barry Bonds. Bonds hit three home runs Sunday in his matchup between the San Francisco Giants and the Colorado Rockies. Homer 61, 62, and 63 put Bonds seven home runs short of Mark McGuire's single season home run record. Bonds plays tomorrow night, Tuesday night in Houston. Inside and Bonds chase for the record and other sports issues in tonight with Greenfield at Large, Bob Costas, the special host tonight, special guest rather with Jeff Greenfield, 1030 Eastern, 730 on the West Coast there. In the meantime, though, let's watch weather and Aaron with Karen McGinnis tonight. Hey, Karen. Aaron does not give up, Bill. We've been watching this since the beginning of September, and now it's made its all the way just off the northeastern shore. It's a good distance here, but take a look at how spectacular it is. A clearly defined eye brushed past Bermuda over the weekend. It is still charging along to the north-northwest with supporting winds of about 115 miles an hour, but it does look like it's going to head more towards the north. So our viewers in the Canadian Maritimes, you need to pay close attention to this. It's still a very powerful hurricane. All right, then there is perhaps our next tropical system. The sixth one of the season could be Felix. Well, to the east of the Leeward Islands, but looks rather spectacular on our satellite imagery. So we're going to forecast it out according to the National Hurricane Center's prognostications going into Thursday. It looks like it is going to be a tropical storm strength, but perhaps by then moving more towards the north-northwest. How about some forecast temperatures coming up? Look at these readings all the way up into the Pacific Northwest. A warm day there. And Bill, into New England, looks like it's going to feel like fall over the next day. Now all right. You. Coming up on that time. Karen, thanks. See you a bit later tonight. All right, Karen. Finally, a race like no other, at least no others we've heard of anyway. A marathon in the wine country of France. And as CNN's Jim Bitterman shows us, winning here is not the important thing. You begin to notice little differences about the Medoc Marathon even before the race begins. Some are taking it seriously. Others have a somewhat less intense approach. And the more you look behind those determined runners at the head of the pack, the more you detect the somewhat irresolute appearance of those who follow. That's because when the marathoners are off, winning is not exactly foremost in everyone's mind. Sure, this is an officially certified 42-kilometer, 26-mile marathon, but it winds not through the concrete canyons of some major city, but through the ripening vineyards and 18th-century chateaus of a Bordeaux region which produces some of the most cultivated wine in the world. And while those who must can always pick up a little water along the route, since this is Madoc, they can also stop for a glass of fine red or an oyster or two along the way. There are naturally those who are convinced that every race goes to the fleetest of foot, but in the Madoc Marathon, there are plenty who would disagree with the notion. The loser is the first one because he has no chance to drink this wine. Of course, the realities of the long-distance run, or walk as the case may be, cannot be ignored. This is one marathon where everyone is free to seek his own personal best. If I could keep drinking until the end, then it was a fine marathon here. <laughs> and as the afternoon wears on, the goals for some runners have been known to change. The one who eats the most oysters without throwing up before finishing went. For his efforts, this year's fastest runner, who admitted he couldn't pass a drug test for wine, was awarded the first prize, his weight in Grand Cru vintages, even while some of his fellow marathoners were still out there somewhere on the course. They say that in the entire 17-year history of this event, only one person has crossed the finish line in less than sober shape. That's what they say. But the organizers also have to admit that they put an end to the race after nine hours. Otherwise, as one put it, it would go on all night long. And indeed, some competitors look as if they wouldn't mind that. Perhaps why they say this conventional length marathon is the longest marathon in the world. Jim Bitterman, CNN, in the Madoc region of France. Run on. That's the first evening news for Monday. I'll be back later on CNN tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern time. Until then, I'm Bill Hemmer in Atlanta. Crossfire begins right now in Washington.